The capitalist system is, a fun, is in fundamental conflict with the climate system. Capitalism, ex, capitalist exploitation of nature is on the flip side to the exploitation of human labor. Ultimately, therefore, to solve the ecological and social crisis, we need a revolutionary movement that creates a new society of free of exploitation, oppression, and the profit motive. A society which measures the quality of life not through the competitive acquisition of things, but by our relationship to each other and nature. That acts to protect and restore our planet for future generations. So that's the statement that we came up with as a um, socialist contention. <laughs> EcologicalSocialist.com, just to check out um, Solidarity as well and the International Socialist Organization, as well as many other groups have come together to help fan this panel and the uh, rally tomorrow and our contingent tomorrow. But just a few others that have come together: the Editorial Board of New Politics, Chicago Socialist Party, West Queens Green Party of New York City, Green Party Manhattan Local, Bronx Green Party, Bronx County Green Party, <laughs> Socialist Horizons. National Socialist Canada, Shut Down Indian Point Now, and Socialist Action, among others. And I believe we also have um, David Schwartzman here tonight as well. If you could just raise your hand. Yeah, he's a professor, professor in bio, biochemistry at Howard University right here in D.C. So um, I'm glad to have him here tonight. Also, Patrick Bond has signed on, director for the Center for Civil Society at the University of um, Kwan Quasulu um, in Durban. Yes. And uh, Mike Davis, professor of creative writing at UC Riverside, as well as author of Planet of Slums, Sebastian is also signed on. And Michael Lowey, member of the editor of the board of um, Ecologie Politique in Paris, France. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so that's awesome. If you want to read more about it, again, you can go to the website, ecologicalsocialist.com, just to see everyone that signed on to our statement and then people that are going to be at the rally tomorrow. Okay, so let's get started with the fun stuff. Um, so <laughs> our speakers collectively will have about 45 minutes to speak, um, about 15 minutes for each speaker. Uh, then we'll have about 40 minutes for discussion, which is extremely important. We want the discussion. If people have questions from the room, they can answer them. Also, we want people to answer questions um, from, the, uh, from the room. Um, we're then going to wrap up and we'll announce the end of contention and tell us about it tomorrow as well. Um, I'm just going to describe briefly how the discussion will be structured. Uh, each speaker will have about uh, three minutes from the room when once we have answered questions. I'll tell you this again, or once people have questions or comments. But if you have a question, raise your fist. If you have a comment, raise your hand. And again, I'm going to say this again as well. Um, questions will be prioritized. And I'll tell you this on this one. Um, okay, so uh, the speakers are going to come back to the end to answer questions. So first we're going to start with uh, Chris Williams. Um, Chris is a longtime environmental activist and author of Ecology of Socialism, which I think I have right here. And um, he would be happy to sign it at the end as well. <laughs> it's a wonderful book. Um, and uh, let's see here. Um, he's a professor of physics and chemistry at Case University and chair of the science department of um, Packard Collegiate Institute and is a regular contributor to the International Socialist Review. And actually to ISR, the International Socialist Review, there's a, like a couple great articles about climate change in it right now, one that Chris wrote. Um, so it's over there at the table at the on the ecological crisis of capitalism. So there's quite a few others, so it's a great, uh, great edition of the ISR. Um, I think that's it. So thanks very much for everybody for coming. We organized this very last minute, uh, the last six days or so. It's been very hectic. And uh, it's fantastic that we're able to put forward some kind of analysis for why this is happening to our planet and uh, go beyond that and ask what can we do to prevent it. So uh, mostly what I'm going to talk about, and, and I think the demonstration tomorrow, uh, I'm extremely excited about it because I think it represents a potential turning point uh, in, the, in the movement for climate uh, justice uh, in this country and around the world. And it's extremely important that we actually try to, from it, see it as a stepping stone to building a national independent movement for climate justice that it does not accept the limitations imposed 
uh, by the two mainstream parties, one of whom is supposedly our friends, but I don't believe is, uh, and uh, makes, starts to knit together all of the different single issue movements, the people who've been fighting for decades around different issues all, all around the country, all the questions that are tied together with race and class in the United States, because it's impossible to talk about anything in the United States without talking about the depths of racism in this country. Um, and so how do we bring those movements together and say, we need an alternative, uh, and we need it urgently, and the time to start building it is now. And, and I actually think that the demonstration tomorrow, much like uh, when I was da going down on the buses in 2009 to the National Equality March, uh, people were wondering how big was it going to be, what was the impact going to be. Well, we've seen the impact uh, of the National Equality March where 200,000 people came out to de demand equal rights uh, for lesbian and gay people. And what happened? Obama had to shift his position because he could no longer contain the movement. Uh, and so laws have changed as a result of that demonstration and all the organization against Prop Proposition 8, which came before that and after it, uh, where we refused to accept the limits imposed uh, by the mainstream politicians, and that's very exciting. I think we are potentially at another kind of moment in the environmental uh, justice movement of a similar nature. That's what I'm hoping for. Uh, anyway, um, but mostly I'm going to use uh, the time this evening, I, I'm kind of the depressing side of the uh, <laughs> equation, uh, which is uh, going to put forward an argument that really this problem is actually systemic. Uh, we have a a, a, an economic and political social system which is fundamentally at odds with our climate system. In fact, we have two systems that are in conflict with each other, the capitalist system and the climate system, and one of them has to give. Uh, and there's no indication that it's going to be capitalism, right? They are marching on. So, uh, currently we are burning, uh, extracting from the earth, um, and setting fire to 93 million barrels of oil every single day. 93 million every day. Uh, that number needs to go down. However, the prediction is for it to rise uh, to 20, by 2020 to 110 million barrels of oil. Uh, and that uh, is just kind of the tip of the iceberg because the International Energy Agency just released a report, uh, report uh, are we entering a golden age of gas? They answer emphatically, yes. Uh, and why? Because of fracking. Uh, because uh, the amount of gas that is coming out of the ground through, this new, the, through the new technologies that they've managed to work out uh, means that uh, the country is awash in natural gas. In fact, so awash that the prices have dropped uh, that they're putting coal out of business. Uh, that you might think, well, that's a good thing, uh, that uh, you know, we're using less coal and we're switching to gas. But the coal companies, if they can't sell it here, they sell it somewhere else. So where is that coal going? If you've seen any pictures of Beijing uh, lately, the, people in, the Chinese people in Beijing are choking on the burning of American coal uh, because it's being exported. Uh, American exports to China of coal have increased by 107% from 2011 to 2012. So much of it is Chinese coal, but nevertheless, you get the, the picture, which is why they're building more coal exporting terminals on the west coast of the United States. Uh, it's also why, of course, they want to build this pipeline uh, from Canada to Texas to carry another million barrels of oil uh, every day uh, and refine them in Texas. And we already know the outcome of that kind of thing, because we had the BP oil spill in 2010. Uh, and uh, what, are the, what is the outcome? Well, I live in a city, uh, New York, that is still suffering from one of the worst storms uh, in the history of the city, uh, completely unprepared, and people are still, uh, thousands of people are still homeless, uh, and they recently actually got kicked out of their hotel uh, spaces by FEMA, even though they can't go back to their houses. So now we have even more homeless people than we normally have in New York City. And this is because the priorities of the system uh, dictate whatever makes the most amount of money in the shortest amount of time is what happens. No other consideration is taken into account. And just to give you one other example of the insanity of this system, it's been much less reported that you can't, it's possible not just to frack for gas, you can frack for oil too. 
the exact same process. So they're doing it hugely. So uh, the Bakken field in North Dakota uh, is the biggest oil field now, on the, one of the biggest contiguous oil fields on the planet. Uh, and in fact, uh, North Dakota now is uh, outshines from space Chicago. Nobody lives there. But what, why does it outshine, outshine Chicago, Chicago? Because they are flaring the natural gas. Oh no! Yes. <laughs> the gas. <laughs> the gas that they are fracking uh, in the northeast of Texas, they are setting fire to in the west because they can't build pipelines fast enough. And the oil company is like, we couldn't care less about the uh, natural gas. We will set fire to it and we will extract the oil. Uh, and I have some quotes, I don't have time to go into it, but the regulatory agency, the government regulatory agency, was asked in North Dakota, why don't you do something about this? And they said, our job is not just to regulate the oil industry, our job is to also increase production. Uh, and so, uh, there's a, then a quote from uh, one of the uh, uh, oil companies saying, if we tried to build pipelines, uh, we would lose out to our competitors. And that is the nature, the insane nature, uh, I don't need to go, I don't think, into any other examples, really, uh, of the stupendous vandalism and waste of this system. Uh, and, you know, when you think about, uh, we have a problem with overfishing, for example, right? We've fished out many of the big fish. Uh, there's only about 9,000 North Atlantic tuna left. Um, what's the answer to that? Is the answer from the system to develop some kind of uh, rational, international, co internationally coordinated plan to address the problem at the root? No. What's their answer? Their answer is to invent an even more polluting industry called fish farming. Right? So, uh, because that will continue to accumulate money. Uh, when that isn't enough, now we have a problem, we haven't got enough fish farms. What's the answer then? Do you go back? and address the original problem uh, of overfishing in the first place. No, you don't do that. Uh, you then genetically modify your fish farms uh, in order to make them grow faster and larger and so on and so forth. So uh, there is never going to be an answer coming from uh, this system uh, because of its historical development and because of the way it operates. And I would say that rests on three things. One, this system, uh, first and foremost, is driven to produce money. It doesn't produce anything else. Anything else is secondary. In fact, Marx uh, came up with three letters to describe the purpose of capitalism. M, C, M prime. You start with M, money. You turn it into a commodity, C. You then sell it for more money, M prime. Uh, and then what do you do with that more money that you've got? Well, you reinvest it back in the production process. In other words, this is a system predicated on endless expansion. And now we are finding out what are the limits of which the Earth can sustain and stay uh, in, the, in the, way, the, the way in which we all grew up and the way in which uh, humans have grown up for the last 10,000 years with this kind of stable climate. And obviously if you don't, I don't need to go into the science really too much, but if you don't have a stable climate, what are you not going to be able to do? Grow things, right? Have agriculture. If you cannot predict when the rains are going to come or when they're going to stop or where they're going to land, or by how much, then you have a significant problem. So what we're doing is not just undermining our own civilization, we're undermining the entire biosphere. Uh, and so when the, when the system, when the capitalists and the apologists for the system uh, regard uh, basically the earth as a subset of their economy, as opposed to the other way around, uh, we have to demand some uh, significant uh, changes because uh, you know, the World Bank is a, is a, you know, people probably saw the, the big publicized report that the World Bank, of all people, uh, came out with saying that we were on target for a four degrees C rise in temperature. Now, and, and, and the, the, the president of the World Bank is quoted as saying, this must not happen. This is a disaster waiting to happen. At the same time as the World Bank is saying this and producing this report, which is all great, right, highlighting the problem, they're still funding uh, the production and building of coal plants, 29 to be exact, some of them the biggest on the planet. There are 1,200 new coal plants around the world under construction right now. So the idea 
that Obama or any mainstream politician is going to do anything about this situation is complete nonsense. Just to throw out uh, one other statistic, uh, the amount of money invested globally to conserve or protect biodiversity is $38 billion. The amount of money invested in uh, the markets for soy, uh, beef, and um, corn, which are causing 80, uh, sorry, not corn, palm oil, uh, which are causing 80% of the deforestation on the planet. The amount of money invested in those markets is $92 trillion compared to $38 billion. Orders of magnitude difference in their priorities. And if you think about it, you know, their system was in crisis in 2008. How did they respond? Did they sit around for 20 years saying, you know what, we've got to get to the root of the problem, we've got to really find out uh, what caused the financial crisis in 2008, uh, we can't make any decisions yet, we've got to wait for consensus, more data's got to come in. Um, we've really got to know exactly what the problem was and where it came from. Of course they didn't. In a heartbeat, they handed trillions of dollars back to the people who caused the crisis in the first place, the banks. Uh, and so when their system is threatened, they don't hesitate to do something. When the entire biosphere is threatened, they just carry on. Um, and so there's something fundamentally flawed uh, at the heart of the system. One thing is the growth imperative that is uh, built into the operation of the system. The second thing is the fact that it's based on profit and competition. And once you've got a system based on uh, profit and competition, then you can forget about long-term planning. Actually, you can forget about any kind of planning. As that uh, you know, West Coast, East Coast, gas flaring, oil production, uh, thing I just mentioned uh, really indicates um, and obviously long-term planning thanks very much uh, long-term planning is exactly what we need right now so on the one hand you know Bloomberg can put this on his uh, front page of his magazine the week after Sandy uh, on the other hand what is New York doing about it right uh, very very little uh, his first plan was to, at the cost of $15 billion, uh, let's build some seawalls. Um, so, apart from the insanity of that idea anyway, it's like, what do you think is going to happen if you build some walls? Uh, where is the water going to go? Um, right, up and over or around. Um, and uh, apart from the cost, the many years into it, uh, you know, Bloomberg really wanted to do something. We could have free public transit in the United States, sorry, in, in New York City, uh, because uh, we put into, the, the seven million New Yorkers uh, put four billion dollars a year into the transit system. We actually have, fairly decent by American standards, for sure, uh, public transit. Uh, we put in four billion dollars. Wall Street for Christmas gets 30 billion dollars. That's their Christmas bonus. So we could take just 10% of what they give Wall Street for Christmas, and 7 million people in New York could have free transport 24-7. Uh, that is the scale of the difference. Or the waste, I mean, talking about uh, fishing, for every kilogram of fish they actually catch and use, they throw away 10 kilograms in so-called bycatch. It's not, it's not profitable, so they just throw it out to die. Uh, it's a completely wasteful system. Uh, or you take the fact that uh, you know, if we really, well, first of all, Obama could do a few things very easily. The first thing he could do is say no to the XL pipeline, right? <laughs> very, very easy for him. He doesn't have, he can't hide behind anybody else anymore. He can't even hide behind the governor of Nebraska. Uh, he is the only person, along with his mate John Kerry, to be able to say yes or no to that problem. So how serious is he? Well, we will find out. Uh, not that we shouldn't have found out uh, a long time ago, really. Um, but that's one thing that would be very easy for him to do. Or what about cutting the Pentagon budget? One trillion dollars. One trillion dollars uh, uh, delivered uh, to death and destruction around the world. What could we do with a trillion dollars? The Pentagon is the single biggest polluter on the planet, not to mention death dealer. 
So uh, it, it actually produces more toxic waste than the five largest chemical corporations combined. It produces more CO2 in a day, the Pentagon, than 135 other countries. Uh, and the Department of Defense is responsible for 80% of the energy usage of the American government. So uh, if Obama really wanted to be serious about climate change and create a much better world and a huge legacy for himself, then we could start talking about cuts to the Pentagon. Because we need more schools, we need more hospitals, we need more teachers, we need more doctors. Uh, our infrastructure is falling to pieces uh, before our eyes. I mean, literally, big bridges are falling down and killing people. Uh, in New York, uh, the city said that only 41% of our bridges and tunnels are up to code. Uh, we need an enormous new infrastructure, not predicated on fossil fuels. That much is obvious. And when they talk about creating jobs, and there's this false uh, dichotomy between if you want to protect the environment, then you can't have jobs. Think about the amount of jobs that we could have. I mean, it's so obvious that this is not anything, I would argue, this has got absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with technology or the fact that we don't have the answers. We know how to generate electricity uh, from sustainable sources. Uh, we know uh, how to insulate homes. We know how to conserve energy. We know how to rebuild our sanitation system, which is another thing that's falling apart uh, because no money is invested in it. Uh, these are, we have answers to these. This is purely a political and social question nothing else. Uh, and so uh, it's about reorienting uh, our, pri our the priorities of our society. And we are the only ones who are going to do that. Because uh, the other part of Marxism is obviously that we are split into contending classes with diametrically opposed interests. And uh, I'm sick, quite frankly, actually, no doubt physically too, uh, from living in this world. Uh, and I'm sick of living in a world based on warfare, racism, sexism, homophobia, uh, competition, where if I get a job, it's at the expense of somebody else, I get a place in school, it's at the expense of somebody else, or I manage to rent a place and somebody else doesn't. As if there is a scarcity of these things, as if we can't uh, build enough houses or enough schools or enough hospitals. Uh, it's insane. I'm sick of living in this world. I want to live in a different world uh, whereby instead of competition, it's based on cooperation. Uh, instead of producing things that make the most amount of money in the shortest amount of time and then break almost immediately after you've bought them, uh, I want to live in a world that makes things because we need them uh, and for no other reason than that, cooperatively. And I want to live in a world that is based on real democracy uh, where we all have a say in the important decisions of our lives. Instead of uh, the madness that uh, the charade, really, uh, that was uh, the, you know, uh, in one of the interviews, uh, MTV interviewed uh, Obama after the election. He's like, uh, so, you know, these debates uh, that you had, the presidential debates, um, they never mentioned climate change in any of them. First time since 1984. How's, he's like, yeah, I was surprised at that too. Um, <laughs> that's, that's his quote. Uh, as if the President of the United States has no ability to raise an issue that he thinks is important. Uh, I think that, ex that showed uh, what his priorities, where his priorities lie. I am absolutely certain that the decision to build Keystone XL was taken quite some time ago, in, sometime in his first term. Uh, there's no way. Oil companies invest in things they don't think are going to happen. They've already started building it down south. You think they're not going to build the rest? They know it's being built. The only thing that is going to stand in the way uh, of it being built is us, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I was going to finish, I've got some other quotes, but I will finish with a quote from uh, Martin Luther King that I think illustrates uh, the quandary that we're in. Uh, we have to take on the entire system, and that was the position that he uh, was laying out uh, towards the end of his life, that it really is a question to go beyond 
the question of political rights uh, and some racial justice, uh, if we want uh, economic rights and complete equality, then we have to start questioning the system. Uh, so the stepping stones along that uh, path are the demonstration tomorrow and the demonstrations to come and the formation of a national independent grassroots movement that uh, moves across borders, that accepts people from anywhere in the world uh, with all of our different differences and says we must overthrow this entire system. Yeah. Uh, we need uh, a revolution, ultimately. Yes. And <laughs> As depressing as this business can be, you know, as an environment as depressing as this, and it is depressing a lot of the times, and you know, there's any number of other statistics I could go into. Uh, as depressing as this can be, uh, I'm extremely hopeful by the demonstration tomorrow. I'm also extremely hopeful by the, by all of the massive global revolt that erupted everywhere last year and continues, right, and is going to grow. We have entered a new age of revolt, rebellion, and revolution. And uh, I think we need to embrace that, and I think we need to do our part here. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you're not already part of an organization or involved, and I'm sure many of you are, then we need to get together. You should join in, uh, because I think being an activist from the age of 15, uh, it's a life worth living. And uh, just to finish with Martin Luther King, uh, we must honestly face the fact that the movement must address itself to the question of restructuring the whole of American society. There are 40 million poor people here, and one day we must ask the question, why are there 40 million poor people in America? And today, the, the, that number is 50 million. And when you ask that question, you're raising a question about the economic system, about a broader distribution of wealth. When you ask that question, you begin to ask the, capitalistic, the question to the capitalistic economy. And you see, my friends, when you deal with this, you begin to ask the question, who owns the oil? You begin to ask the question, who owns the iron ore? You begin to ask the question, why is it that people have to pay water bills in a world that's two-thirds water? And those are the kind of questions that we have to ask mm. today, tomorrow, and going forward. seriousness what really impresses me is not who's up here but you all um, the incredible number and diversity of people who have turned out to this we have members of different socialist organizations different activist organizations members of the Green Party unaffiliated activists and I I'm really happy with that I think that uh, dealing with the ecological crisis is an issue which seems to be bridging organizational boundaries, which I think is something we need. I think the left is far too fragmented in the United States, and I think that we need yes. further joint action of the kind that we're starting right here. So I'm very happy with that. So Chris discussed why uh, capitalism can't solve the ecological crisis. I want to discuss what kind of society can. What's our vision? Um, I think for the reasons that Chris outlined, it's going to need to be a post-capitalist society. I would say a socialist society, an eco-socialist society. <clears throat> when you get rid of capitalism, you also can get rid of a lot of fundamental assumptions of capitalism, which shape our world, and when we get rid of these, we open up a lot of possibilities for totally reshaping the ways we produce and consume. Assumptions such as, under capitalism, things have to be produced for private profit. The economy is not planned. 
there is a rigid distinction between productive work, which is done collectively in the workplace, and domestic work, which is done individually in the home. And finally, under capitalism, things have to be produced as commodities to be sold at, at, by two individual buyers. Uh, in a society where we're not bound by these assumptions, we'll be free to remake our ways of living, to create a society in which people have a decent standard of living, but we, it's ecologically sustainable, and also to create a society that's better in many other ways, such as it's fully, truly democratic, it's not alienated, and work is fulfilling rather than draining. I think we need to be creating a vision of society in which uh, we expand the realization of human potential while shrinking our ecological footprint. In other words, we need development and not growth. I think it's very important to assert this in order to avoid um, the arguments that you hear sometimes, such as that we need to lower our standard of living, or even worse, that it's the fault of the poor people in the developing world who are having too many babies. It's really important that we not come across as promoting a new austerity from the left. Instead, we need to be creating a vision of a world that people want. Thank you. Sorry to talk over your applause. Um, we need a world that people want. We do need to change those aspects of society, which run very deep in the society, that make our standard of living unsustainable, like our transport system, our agricultural system, our ways of producing. We need to find ways to produce things that meet people's needs, but in different ways. And I think for some of the reasons Chris outlined, this will take a total restructuring of society, not only changing produ production, but democratizing our economy and political system. This is going to have to occur through a revolutionary democratic process of social transformation from below. We can't plan out exactly what it's going to look like. It's going to have to get worked out as it happens. As a matter of fact, we can't even imagine all the ways an eco-socialist society would be different from our own because we're steeped in the ideas of capitalism. But we can make some conjectures, some predictions. There will be changes in a number of areas of society. One of these is our use of technology. As Chris outlined, we'll be able to use technologies that we already have, but which aren't used now because they're not consistent with the demands of profit. For example, solar, wind, geothermal, and tidal energy <coughs> production. We'll also be able to use organic agriculture and permaculture techniques. Further, we'll be able to create new kinds of technologies because we'll redirect our research and development into sustainable solutions, not producing private profit or net military technologies. <clears throat> there will also be changes in production because we'll be able to break out of capitalism's need for endless growth, endless expansion. For example, when there's a new technology that comes along which allows us to produce with less labor time, what we'll do is we would produce the same amount and have everybody work less instead of what we do now, which is have everybody work the same amount or more and produce even more. That doesn't make any sense. So this suggests that there will also be some changes in work and leisure. We'll have less work overall, more leisure time, more variety in how we spend our lives to do fulfilling activities like creative pursuits and hobbies. Uh, we'll redesign our jobs to make them more fulfilling, make our workplaces democratic. Uh, we'll feel a closer connection with the production of food and resources, and overall we'll have the freedom to live more fulfilling lives, less centered around consumption, so people won't feel a need to buy so much stuff. Yeah. There'll be changes in domestic life. We can institute neighborhood cooperatives, for example, to do domestic labor like cooking, cleaning, laundry, child care. This is much more energy efficient because it's more efficient to do it collectively rather than having everybody own appliances in their home and do it themselves. It's also part of women's liberation because it abolishes the gender division of labor, which is one of the foundations of women's oppression. We'll also see changes in urban structure. We can redesign our cities around walking, biking, and public transit. We can have more parks and social gathering spaces for interaction that's not centered around consumption, so you don't have to go to the mall to hang out. We can experiment with new forms of housing, such as getting rid of single-family houses with big yards. And finally, in a post-capitalist society, we'll be able to eliminate a great deal of waste will be able to eliminate wholesale a large number of industries which do nothing to contribute to human well-being, such as the military, such as advertising, finance, the health insurance industry, if we have universal health care. Those are just four that come to mind right now. We can eliminate product packaging. We can eliminate planned obsolescence, so computers and cell phones mm. and stuff like that will last longer, so everybody can have them even though we produce fewer of them. Yeah, These yeah. are just a few of the many changes that open up when we get rid of capitalism.
I think that in these circumstances, the level of individual consumption and the ecological footprint of our society will naturally decrease without anybody needing to be told to cut your consumption or lower your footprint. I'm making the argument that the ecological vision and the socialist vision come together. They are one, because in order to undertake the measures that are necessary to make our society sustainable, we also have to liberate our society. We will have to end the exploitation of workers, the oppression of women, the oppression of black people, and other oppressed nationalities. We'll have to dismantle the repressive state that we have now and create a thoroughly democratic one, and society will have to undertake a centrally <coughs> planned, democratically planned effort to reestablish the metabolism between society and nature. So I'd like to talk now about what this vision means, uh, this line of thinking means for what we should do now in our struggle. I'd like to talk first about a number of other struggles I think we should be working to ally with, really all struggles are allied with the ecological struggle because all aspects of society are connected with our relationship to nature. So all struggles for justice are struggles for environmental justice. But I'm going to highlight a few struggles in particular. I think it's critical that we struggle against imperialism and environmental racism in the United States and internationally. Um, internationally, in order for the developing world to live in an ecologically sustainable way, we need cancellation of the debt cancellation of all the ties that bind these countries to producing for Western export, including we need to end the global U.S. military presence so that these countries can produce locally for their own consumption in a sustainable manner, which, by the way, would largely end the global food crisis for which corporations give us phony, destructive solutions such as Monsanto's genetically engineered seeds. Um, domestically, I think we need to speak to the needs of the most oppressed in our society. We need yes. to focus on environmental racism. Sometimes people say that the environmental movement is all white. Um, I think that couldn't be more wrong. There is all sorts of environmental activism in communities of color. For example, defending neighborhoods from toxic pollution, food justice work. There is a problem, however, that when activists talk about global warming, sometimes people talk about it in a way that ignores the ne specific needs of the most oppressed communities. We talk about it like, well, it's something that affects everybody, which is true, but I think it's also critical that we highlight the particular issues of uh, oppressed communities. So I think we should be seeking allegiances there. I want to particularly highlight um, the indigenous struggle and indigenous perspectives. As we've seen with Idle No More, indigenous peoples are often at the vanguard of environmental struggles. Geographically, they're often some of the most affected people by resource extraction. Further, I think their struggles strike at the heart, strike at the very basis of the capitalist colonial settler states of the United States and Canada. So strategically, I think they're very important. We have to ally with these movements, make indigenous sovereignty part of our platform. Um, I think we have a lot of work to do in this area. We wanted to have an indigenous speaker as part of this forum, but we just didn't have the connections to do it. So I think that that shows that we, we, we need to do a lot of work in, in, in building those connections and developing those political relationships, as well as engaging in a, in a serious political dialogue with those kinds of perspectives. Um, finally, in addition to struggles against environmental racism, I think that it's critical that we ally with the movement of the working class in the United States and globally. So much of what we need But so much of what we need has to do with the transformation of the way our society produces, and the working class is, of course, central to that. Now, we need to seek this alliance not in a bureaucratic way, not from above. We can't just have the union president come and speak at our rally. It needs to be a transformative movement from below that militantly struggles and opens up space for imagining new ways of working, new ways of producing. I think we saw a spark of this kind of working class movement with the Chicago teachers strike a few months ago, and I think that's an example of what we should be trying to build an ally with. So from this vision and from the <coughs> allied movements I've laid out, we can present a number of demands that I think are important to highlight in environmental work. Things like a reduced work week with the same amount of pay, free mass public transit, uh, indigenous sovereignty, globally, in the U.S. and abroad, put the land in the hands of the people who farm it, not corporations and rich landowners. Mm. 
other demands, end all U.S. wars, forgive the third yes. world debt, put production in the hands of the workers. <coughs> Not all of these demands directly address the environment, but all of them relate to the kind of social transformation that we need. So I think they are all part of an ecological program. Uh, in addition to these individual demands, we can also be putting forth the kind of a vision of a better, different, livable world that I tried to outline at the beginning of my talk. Um, speaking to the socialists in the room, I think we have some unfinished business. I think that our task is to build an eco-socialist pull within the environmental movement, putting forth a strategy based on a revolutionary vision, so build both the movement as a whole and the revolutionary uh, part of that movement. We have to see ourselves as building a current within the movement which goes well beyond our individual our revolutionary organizations. Uh, what this looks like, the role of revolutionaries in the movement, I think is yet to be fully defined. No one group that exists now has the answer. We have to continue to work together as we're starting to do here. Um, I want to close by saying that, yes, uh, things can feel pretty hopeless sometimes. If anybody who's familiar with the science knows that the situation is extremely urgent, in fact, some scientists say that it's already too late to avert catastrophic global warming. But if it's not too late, it's really urgent. And it doesn't exactly look like the ecological revolution is right around the corner, in spite of the upsurge of struggles. But uh, what I think is powerful about the eco-socialist vision is that it connects building an ecological society with what's in people's self-interest. It's not about telling people to cut back. It's not about blaming the poor or the majority of people. It's about tr creating the kind of society that we want, a society that's truly democratic, truly fulfilling, a world really worth living in. Eco-socialism is synonymous with the interest of the working class, the majority of the world's population who sell their labor for a living. I think if we can foster the self-organization of the working class, if we can develop the struggle so people come to see that self-interest, develop their own visions of a better world, if we can unleash the potential that exists within the tensions of the present social order, then we can win. this current system is, both by way of our climate and our economy. We don't need 
need to convince people. You know, in a world where one out of two Americans is in poverty or low income and heading for poverty, where nine out of 10 jobs being created for the foreseeable future in the United States now are low income, uh, low wage, insecure, uh, low benefit jobs. This is what the future looks like, where 36 million students are essentially indentured servants who are in debt and uh, who don't have the jobs to be able to get their way out of debt. Half of all college graduates now are working uh, jobs that you don't need a college degree for, so they're carrying around college debt without being able to get college jobs. Mm. Uh, you know, this is what our economy looks like, yet we continue to bail out the banks. $85 billion a month. This is bailout number three going into some seven or $20 trillion worth, depending on how you count it. And we're still bailing out the banks. They have more money than ever. They are not loaning it to people. They're not loaning it to businesses. Uh, businesses aren't growing because they know that everyday people don't have money to spend. So, you know, the system is in complete gridlock, but we don't have to convince people that it's broken. We just let, need to let people know that there is an alternative and that we can fix this. As Alice Walker and others before <coughs> her have said, the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing that we have it to start with. Mm, mm. But we do have it. <laughs> and, you know, I think one of the most exciting things of this particular historic moment that we're in, you know, in the middle of this climate crisis, when we have gathered from all across the country not to have Obama's back, but to tell him to get out of the way. <laughs> now, I think some of the leadership here may be trying to constrain the message, but from what I'm hearing down in the street, that's not what people are thinking here out in the street. People feel like we need someone at our back, not someone stabbing us in the back. <laughs> about that with the recent uh, State of the Union address. I don't know how many had the misfortune of listening to it. <laughs> but if you need some good therapy, we did a green rebuttal alternative, uh, which you can get to through the Green Party website at GPUS. Highly therapeutic to understand that, you know, they can only shove this stuff on us by <coughs> silencing our voices, which is why they work so hard, which is why they arrested Sherry Hongala and myself and chained us to chairs mm -hmm. for eight hours for the duration uh, of the debates. Because if people were to hear us, if they were to hear what you are saying in this room, they agree <coughs> with us and they would never put up with this knowing that there's a different way to do it. And it's not only you know, the crash of our economy, it's also the crash of our climate. The fact that with less than one degree centigrade, you know, we are having record heat waves, storm, drought, rising food prices, floods, in fact, which have closed down our nuclear power plants even. You know, that's how sustainable that mode of energy is. It's not only that a flood can shut it down, but also droughts will put our nuclear plants into incredible peril because it takes an awful lot of water to keep the uh, nuclear power plants cool and to keep the rods cool. This is a disaster waiting to happen. And you know, you put it all together, we've got an incredible crisis on our economy, an incredible crisis uh, on our climate, and there is Obama in the State of the Union address basically saying, what do we need? We need more free trade agreements, mm, you know, yeah. to keep sending our jobs overseas and undermining our wages at home. You know, he's talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, mm -hmm. which is NAFTA on steroids, mm -hmm. and now talking also about an Atlantic Partnership, which will be, you know, just uh, un unthinkable. 
Um, he's talking about raising the minimum wage, and that's nice, but what is he talking about? Nine dollars an hour, which basically means locking working people again into poverty wages. That is a poverty wage. We need a living wage. And on climate, as you know, he talked about all of the above as the solution. As far as the climate is concerned, the climate doesn't care about renewable energy. The climate cares about greenhouse gases. Renewable energy is important because it allows you to reduce greenhouse gases and meet human needs. But if you're producing renewable energy and you're <coughs> skyrocketing your output of carbon dioxide and methane through fracking and other greenhouse gases, nature doesn't know and nature doesn't care. What the climate cares about is the carbon dioxide that you're putting out. And that's what, you know, Obama is skyrocketing. You know, there's a new name for this country. It's called Saudi America because we are on our way to being, you know, the number one oil producer. And there was Obama bragging in the State of the Union address about having boosted oil production greater than it's been in the last 15 years and a gas production greater than it's ever been. At the same time that he has the gall, you know, to pretend that he's now the climate president and he's rescuing the climate while he's, you know, uh, embracing this drill baby drill all of the above policies, so it's absolutely outrageous. And what made me, I guess, sort of not lose my mind in watching that address was seeing him really shooting himself in the foot. And I thought, oh my god, he's done this right before the climate rally. He's basically blown his cover. Because anyone who's not asleep at the wheel <laughs> knows that to be talking about all of the above and escalating methane production and, and fracking and offshore oil and using our national lands and our national parks to be expediting this and devising ways around regulation so that we can hurry up and make it happen faster. You know, it, it said to me, wow, this has got to be the breaking point for the climate movement. And I must say that being here, I am so feeling that from even the conversations uh, on the bus for the last 12 hours on the, on the way down here that um, you know people just cannot uh, conscience this uh, what's been the party line here about having Obama's back and about Obama being the great leader who's going to lead us out of this wilderness. He's not, you know. He is the misleader that we need to leave behind, and the sooner we do it, the better we're going to fix this problem. <laughs> From my point of view, we're not here to beg and plead on bended knees with Obama. No. We're here, basically, uh, to protest his failure to stop the Keystone Pipeline and to say that we are the ones who are going to stop the Keystone Pipeline. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, let's give credit where it's due because uh, I likewise cannot see any chance, you know, in hell that he's going to stop the Keystone Pipeline. They're already building it. ExxonMobil was one of the major funders of Obama's inaugural festivities. You know, there, there is no way that Obama is saying to ExxonMobil and all the other oil companies that he's going to stop their investment. This is what the American economy is about now. It has been, uh, you know, we have become a third world uh, oil developing country. When in his speech he talked about, let's bring in those big corporations like we are some colonial nation that needs to import the powerful multinational corporations 
to tell us how to run an economy. Mm. You know, thank you very much. Uh, you can keep your multinational corporations <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and good riddance to you all. Yeah, we yeah, can yeah, create yeah. our own economy right here, a worker-friendly economy, a people-powered economy, right. a 99% economy. Yeah. 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 And that's what the Green New Deal is all about. And, and I'll just say a word about that. The Green New Deal, you know, it's not like we need to um, uh, reinvent the wheel here. We already have a good time-tested solution. They're talking about austerity. Mm. You know, they keep inventing this national debt crisis, which is, you know, it is a concocted crisis. We're paying 6% of our GDP on national debt right now under George <laughs> Uh, H. Bush, we were paying 15%. So, you know, in the, in the spectrum of American history, we are at a low point, a relatively low and manageable point in the national debt. So this is all part of that irrational, concocted um, world that we're living in that has nothing to do with rational thought or actual reality. This is just a, um, uh, a public relations campaign of the corporate 1% <coughs> to continue squeezing more profits out of people and out of the environment. You know, it's nonsense. It's to be rejected. We're seeing evidence right now in Europe of what austerity does to us. You know, austerity will make a, a bad recession. Uh, it will turn it into a real depression. And that's what it did in the 1930s as well. So we know that austerity is not the solution. Cutting jobs is not the solution. It's creating jobs, which is the solution. Uh, and that's what we need to do. Not one million jobs, which is what the president was talking about. We need to create 24 million jobs and put an end to unemployment so that everyone has a job, a good living wage job, at the same time yes. that we are green energy, relocalized economy. Uh, and the Green New Deal would do that on an emergency basis, create a Marshall Plan, essentially for transforming the economy like now, not in five years, but now. Uh, and, and that can be done. And we would do that by investing in clean renewable energy and conservation. We can put millions of people to work. We don't need the Keystone Pipeline. The Keystone Pipeline creates mostly temporary, transient jobs. Uh, I saw one figure today suggesting that it would create 20 permanent jobs. <laughs> um, we don't need to look to energy that kills us, <coughs> destroys our environment. Uh, that pollutes the planet in order to create jobs. We create jobs right now for people who don't even have high school degrees in conservation, weatherization, insulation, and so on. We can put the jobs right now in the communities that need them at the same time that we drastically <coughs> undercut our, our energy use. We can create sustainable local organic agriculture in our communities, we can create public transportation, uh, which is renewable and energy efficient. Uh, we can create clean manufacturing. Uh, and at the same time, we can also create the jobs that meet our social needs uh, for health care. Let's hire back those hundreds of thousands of teachers who've been laid off yeah. and get them back into our schools. Yes. That's what we need. Not the problem with our school systems. It is not our teachers and right. it's definitely not our teachers. Mm -hmm. so, you know, so, so these solutions are there. There's enormous public support for all of this, for creating a Medicare for all health care system that would put everybody into a complete health care system at the same time that we would save not, it doesn't cost us, it saves us trillions of dollars uh, over the next decade. We can pay down that deficit simply by moving to a Medicare for all single payer health care system. Yes. Forget that. Yes. Forget, forget Medicare for all to taxing the rich, which we need to do a tax, a very small sales tax on Wall Street. 
We in this room are paying 10% sales tax. How come Wall Street isn't paying any? They can pay a half a percent sales tax and can generate $350 billion a year. That right there is practically enough to pay for the Green New Deal, the cost of creating 25 million jobs. So, What they really mean is that there's no money for you. There's plenty of money for wars, Wall Street bailouts, and tax breaks for the wealthy. So we're going to say, we're changing that all around. And by the way, do you know where 50% of our carbon emissions come from? Where? The 1%. So how about that? If we begin to create a more equitable society, then suddenly that 1% no longer has that money to burn, which they use to burn up the planet with. So, you know, there's a, a climate scientist in the UK named Kevin um, Anderson, I believe. He's sort of like the Jim Hansen uh, of, of the United Kingdom. And he makes the point, it's not unfixable. You know, we can actually fix this. Yeah, in many ways, we are right at those tipping points. But we can, we can deal with this right now. It'll take, you know, It'll take 10 years to convert our energy system. But if we can just get the 1% to behave, and there are many ways to do that, and it's not by asking nicely. <laughs> we can drastically reduce our emissions overnight because behavior, and behavior which is uh, incentivized and reduced can be changed. It doesn't take 10 years to build a whole infrastructure to change behavior. So it's possible to change behavior, to put a tax on carbon, to change our energy patterns, uh, our energy utilization, to say no to fracking, no to the Keystone, no to more offshore oil. We have to start <coughs> reducing our carbon, expen our carbon expenditure budget right now not continuing to grow it by smaller amounts, we have to start cutting it now. And in doing so, we can create more healthy, resilient, um, and prosperous, sustainably prosperous and equitable <laughs> communities. This is within our reach. We have the power. It's all about standing up and asserting that power. It's about building this kind of coalition between the Green Party and the ISO and the, the uh, Eco-Socialist Alliance. This is how we can do it. It's between workers and students and the climate movement. We have all hit the breaking point. We are beyond the breaking point. So this is a really good time to turn the breaking point into a tipping point. Yes. And let's take back our democracy and the future.